Thanks so much to all my patrons. Join now to help support the channel and help pick the books I review on this channel. Link in the description. Welcome back, everybody, to my top 100 countdown of my favorite fantasy novels of all time, from number 100 down to number 1. Today, we're going to be going through numbers 70 through 61. Uh, if you want to catch up with the series, if you haven't done so already, uh, click on right here. You can go back and watch the previous videos so you can catch up to see what you've missed before now. So, without further ado, let's jump right into number 70, and that is Before They're Hanged. This is the second book in the original First Law trilogy by Joe Al Abercrombie, uh, and this was published in 2007. Uh, so I think a lot of people are familiar with the First Law universe. Uh, it is one of the more popular uh, fantasy series that have come out in the past 20 years or so uh, for a very good reason. And it's kind of defined, I think, the more modern, grim, dark sort of tag that you put on book, uh, put on books. Even though I think Joe Abercrombie would disagree with that tag, uh, it definitively is, uh, is part of that. And I think in general, what you're going to find is that a large amount of people are going to have this book before they are hanged, uh, the second in the trilogy, as the worst of the trilogy. Now, some people may say the first one's worse, uh, and pretty much everyone's going to agree the last one is the best. Um, and I agreed with that. Um, that principle that the second one is the worst when I read it the first time. Um, you know, there's some problems with it, with the pacing. I mean, the pacing feels odd. Uh, you've got these characters that end up going on this really long journey, which is only part of the book, and only some of the POV, or one of the POV characters goes on this journey. Uh, but a decent amount of the book is involved in this journey. And it, it, without spoiling anything, the the res what results from that journey is not what the reader would come to expect or enjoy. Um, it's almost done intentionally to make you not enjoy it. And I know it's a grimdark book. You're not really supposed to enjoy things in them. But I find myself enjoying a lot of things about grimdark because I like the unexpected nature of that uh, and the realism of characters that you feel like act like people would normally act in those kind of situations uh, and a lot of shades of gray. There's so many good things to love about it. Um, but I, I agreed that the first time reading this, it was very uh, underwhelming what, uh, what resulted from this, from the second book is in the pinnacle part of the book. It just felt very like it took the winds out of it. But the second time reading it, um, and that's the reason this is, shows up on this list. Cause I don't think it was in the last time I did my top hundred list, like two years ago. Um, I found so much to love about it because you no longer have that moment of like, okay, what's going to happen? And then get underwhelmed. You know what's going to happen. You understand it. You appreciate it for what it is. And it makes rereading this just immensely, immensely better. Um, in general, in these books, these are just wonderfully crafted darker books. The audiobook narration to all of these books is the pinnacle of fantasy literature. It is like the greatest thing that could exist. Even Pacey just knocks it out of the park. And to get such a wonderful script that uh, that you'd have from somebody like Abercrombie matched up with the best audiobook narrator in the game just turns into something truly special and something that everybody needs to uh, needs to check out. So yeah, don't sleep on this one. It is wonderful. I know the ending kind of sucks the first time, but there is a reason for it. It all makes sense. And you just got to write it uh, if, and figure out what Joe Abercrombie is trying to, trying to get you to figure out here. Uh, so without going too much further into this video, um, I do want to mention something kind of serious to me. And so recently I, I Googled myself um, just a few days ago, and I was shocked at just how much of my personal information is out there for anybody to see. My full address, uh, my phone number, where I work, and even my exact salary. And this is all like, it's all correct, and it's kind of freaky. Um, you know, it's all right there on the internet for people with bad intentions to take advantage of. This, understandably, makes me feel rather unsafe and completely opens me up for phishing attacks and huge amounts of spam. And that experience is exactly why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. So Aura shows me all the data brokers that are selling my private information and automatically submits opt-out requests to get my data removed. Uh, this makes me way less vulnerable to phishing schemes, identity theft, and annoying robocalls and spams, and it does it in a way that I don't think I'd be able to figure out myself, um, which is 
is the beauty of this. It doesn't just save time. It actually gives you a service that you can't do by yourself. Uh, but Aura does so much more than just data broker opt-outs to keep me safe online. I also get dark web monitoring, fraud alerts, identity theft insurance, a VPN, a password manager. It's like an all-in-one cybersecurity toolkit. So instead of me having to sign up and manage a bunch of separate apps and I'm spending a ton of money, with Aura, I get everything I need to protect my privacy at one fair price. So head on over to Aura.com slash fantasy book to start your two-week free trial and see if everything that Aura can do to keep your personal information safe. I have the link down in the video description as well, so click on that, check it out. You know, with scammers getting craftier every day, Aura gives me that extra layer of digital defense I want for complete safety and privacy. So with that out of the way, let's jump right back into the list with number 69, and that is The Shadow Rising. This is the fourth book in the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan, and this was published in 1992. Um, so I read all these obviously chronologically, and at the time, it's not the case anymore, and you'll find out later in this video, but it was the best book in the series uh, at that point, and I, I, I believe I rated them all better than the previous ones, which is just such a beautiful way to start out your series, when every book is better than the one preceding it. Um, and I didn't think that possible because of how much I truly loved uh, the third one in the series, The Dragon Rising. Um, and I just found this one, for the first time, highly enjoyable from start to finish. I had problems with some of the other books, not major ones, I, I really liked them all. Um, especially the first one I had some problems with. Some in the second, very few in the third, but none in this fourth one, and that's just awesome. It is the hallmark of a great series when the books continue to get better and better as they go along. And while that's certainly not possible uh, through all of these books, because we certainly get a slog here, the quality does not continue to rise, nor would that ever be the expect expectation for an enormous series like this. You know, it it's certainly certainly just a, on its own, very unique that every book is better than the last and even four books. It's just very rare for that to happen. I mean, another one I can think of that happening, at least for me, was uh, The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwen, and we'll hear about those books later on. But yeah, this book is fantastic. It hits all of the right notes. You know, for me, this is where I really found myself falling in love with the series. Um, you know, I really liked it up to that point. I was fully in love with it later on in the series, but this is the moment where it's like, man, this is really something special. You know, I, I was a bit weary, you know, that this book went down the path of splitting up all the characters and having a bunch of mini stories within the larger book, something that I didn't love that executed in The Lord of the Rings. I felt like they spent too much time on individual characters and characters would like disappear for a whole book. But in this one, and I can't almost explain why, but it was done with such precision, and I'm thoroughly glad with what Robert Jordan has done here. And it made me appreciate those scenes all the more. You know, if you're – in the grand scheme of things, if you're going to have a really long series, it can make things very hectic to just be flashing from scene to scene with different characters. And you don't get to settle down and just really appreciate what that character is going through. And for Robert Jordan to have the bravery of saying, I'm just going to go right – like 200 pages from this one character's perspective. And then we're going to go jump onto another one. And maybe another character isn't even going to show up in this book. We'll show up in another one. That's awesome. And that's what's needed to get me connect with these characters and really appreciate the themes that the author is trying to throw at me in the, in these, in these books. I mean, the scenes in the Aiel waste or ale waste, I don't know how to say it. I read these, did not listen to them and I don't watch the TV show, but the scenes with Rand in that wasteland were truly spectacular. I loved everything about the ale and their culture, you know, and, and to have so many pages in this book devoted, not only to them as they currently are, but also delving into the history of what brought them to that point was incredible. I love the history here. It felt like I was, I didn't realize I needed it so much to make me really connect with the world building here, but it was awesome. And there's like sections of this book that do this huge jump backwards. And there's some of the best scenes that I've ever read in any fantasy book of all time. It's truly maybe like the most memorable aspects of the entire Wheel of Time series for me. It's just a masterclass in what storytelling can be. And I think what really made it stand out too is that the book didn't constantly utilize these interesting, weird, different types of storytelling. It saved it for the fourth book to then say like, oh, look what I can do. And that is just cool. 
and it, beyond cool. It's just magnificent. You know, as soon as I figured out what was happening and why, it was literally jaw dropping. And it's extremely special to me as a reader. You know, I, I also like thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the parent sections involving the two rivers. And without spoiling anything, it's a wonderful like side quest that hits all of the emotional tones perfectly. And it does a great job at developing Perrin as a main character. Likewise, the Nanive and Elaine plot lines were incredible and action-packed and awesome. The Sea Folk is such an awesome aspect of these books, and seeing Nanave turn into such a strong power like in this world was wonderful. Like the White Tower section was shocking, and I really didn't see it coming on what ended up happening in the story towards the end. But I love it, I, and I couldn't wait to see what happens further for Swan and Leanne. I don't know how to say these names, but I think you know who I'm talking about. But yeah, it was awesome. Totally, totally got me hooked and just forever cemented this as an all-time series for me. So, number 68 is The Justice of Kings. This is the first book in the Empire of the Wolf series by Richard Swan, and this was published recently, back in 2022. Um, and this is a book that shocks me that it, it has gone on my list and stayed here, uh, because it is not a book that you would ever expect me to enjoy. I've said this before, but I'll have to say it again. But this is a book that is one part mystery novel, Okay, that's a check against you. I don't like mystery novels. It's like one part horror. That's another mark for you. I, I don't like that very much. And it also, on, an, on another part, it's very isolated story that takes place 95% of it in a single isolated town. Yeah, another check against you. I like big, sprawling, epic fantasy stories. So how did this list, how did this book defy all of these things set in front of it of things that I don't normally like and end up being not just on my top hundred list, but down in the sixties. Um, and I think it just all comes down to how amazing Richard Swan is that he's able to craft this all together in such an amazing way. He took the things that I don't like about those genres and tossed them out and really focused on the things that I didn't realize that I do love. Um, this, suspenseful nature to the the detective sort of like mystery type things was all there. It didn't spend the whole time trying to delve into it. It didn't waste pages by just needlessly going over the who done it. Okay, I get it. I don't know who it is. Let's just go through the motions and eventually we'll get to the final act of the story where it picks up. It kind of removes that middle portion. Uh, and substitutes it with some really cool world building at the beginning of the story and some really cool world building at the end of the story. Um, it takes the horror aspects where I don't like to be scared. I don't get enjoyment out of this. I don't like it in video games. I don't like it in movies. Um, I'm not like the most easily scared person, but I don't enjoy that feeling. It's not, it doesn't it get excitement out of me. It makes me have a stressful time. Um, and what it did here that I loved was it saved those horror elements for a specific part of the book. Um, and so you had, I don't know, 50, maybe 100 pages of truly kind of gripping, edge of your seat, really scared for the fate of these characters and what's going to happen. Um, but then we went back and we got rid of that and we moved on. And so it was just a wonderful usage of this, but to saying like, yeah, we'll, we'll give you the shotgun blast of it. But then the rest of the story, you know, we'll just tell a story. And, and that's great. Um, and the fact that everything took place in a single town ended up working beautifully. Because you got to learn about these characters more. And by the end of it, you realize that the whole trilogy is not going to be taking place in this town. Now we're opening up the story. We basically told the prologue story to show the motivations for these characters. Especially the motivation for the bad character. Um, and to say, now the story is going to blow up. We're going to get turning into more of an epic fantasy. You needed to know this. Now let's move on. And that's just great. It's awesome stuff. Amazing, amazing technical skill to pull all these little things together. Um, and I just love it. So number 67 is Jade War. This is the second book in the Greenbone Saga trilogy by Fonda Lee. And this was published in 2019. I had trouble placing this one here um, because I don't necessarily love this one that much more than the first one. And I don't necessarily love the third, third one that much more than the second one, even though I ultimately did rank them in that order. Um, oops, geez, getting aggressive here, uh, talking about books. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, 
it, I think ultimately there's a few things that happen in the third book that make this make that one kind of stand in a different you know different level than this one. And I'll talk about those when I get there. Um, but also brought up the tension to a better level. I'm already familiar with the characters. We got to jump right into the plot. Didn't have to do this build-up time period that the first book had to do, which first books most of the time have to do, unless you've got some really interesting writing skills, like a Steven Erickson that can just go like, all right, and we're off to the races. Um, but this one built it up like almost every fantasy book does in the first one. But here we just got, we know the characters, we love the characters, we hate the characters, we sometimes love and hate the same character. Um, and now we just get to go. And it's great. I love the Greenbone Saga. Um, you know, this is one of the best series that's come out in the last handful of years. Um, I, I think this woman, Fonda Lee, is, is, is truly gifted. And... You know, I don't know how much it's going to translate into other books as we go along, because part of the reason that I loved this one was the was the specific genre that it was, and the fact that it knocked that genre out of the park. This is a fantasy mafia story set in Asia, or a made-up Asian-inspired land. And that is so cool to me. You know, <laughs> it's so awesome. The concept, now executing it is a different thing, but she nailed that too. I mean, the fact that she's able to, I, I, the character work in this one really stood stood apart um, from the normal fantasy book. I, and the depth of the characters and the changes that the characters have to go through, especially one of the characters. I don't want to tell you who. If you think if you've read this book, there's a moment in this book that'll just shock you. It'll go like, oh, that character is different than I've been leading on. And it did that beautiful thing that I love in books where the author kind of tells you who a character is in their core. Um, and then you kind of forget about it because you see these other sides to them. Uh, but then they, the author goes back and goes, no, this, this character is like that. And I wasn't lying to you. You just didn't see it yet. And then you're like, oh yeah, the stories are true. Awesome stuff. Great writing techniques. And yeah, funnily awesome, awesome, awesome. Check out this trilogy. If you like anything involving mafia stories, so, number 66 is The Wandering Inn. This is the first book in The Wandering Inn series by Pirate Abba, and this was published in 2017. Um, I think this is going to be the one that is a little bit controversial in the sense that I think most people would tell you that The Wandering Inn, the first book, is the worst of The Wandering Inn series. I think I kind of agree. We'll see later on in this list as we go along. This one does get a little bit of a bump because it introduced me to the world and made me fall in love with it, and I have these very positive memories of learning about things for the first time. Some books I will knock. I'm, you know, I'm not consistent. <laughs> just let's just get that out of the part, out of the way right now. But sometimes I don't love the build-up time period. I, I, it feels needless. Sometimes I would cherish it forever because everything is so confusing, and just learning about the world as a character is learning about the world can be a really enjoyable experience, which is what this one is. The Wandering In, for those of you that don't know, and I feel like a lot of people that watch my channel know about this. If not, for any other reason, then I talk about it a lot. And not a lot of people talk about this series. I think more are catching on to the greatness of this, um, especially in the booktube community. It seems to be catching a little bit. Well, let's, let's fan these flames a little bit here with talking about it more. Uh, but the, the Wandering In is a lit RPG progression fantasy story. Um, so what I mean by these words, uh, lit RPG, it's like a video game. Uh, characters have stat points, they can rank up, there's magical weapons, they have different powers, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's a progression fantasy, where characters get stronger and stronger as they go along in a pretty linear pace. Um, and it oftentimes you find these blended together. Um, you know, you can certainly have progression fantasies that are not lit RPGs. I feel like most of the time you have a lit RPG, it has progression elements in it. But... Uh, the education lesson for uh, classifications of books is now over. Let's talk about this one a little bit. It involves this woman, Erin. She gets dropped, uh, and she doesn't know why, into this world that is essentially in Dungeons & Dragons. Um, not exactly that, but it feels like that. She doesn't understand why she's there, but it, she ends up finding an abandoned inn. She says, I'm going to move in here. She moves in. She starts cleaning it up for a little bit, tries to make it look a little nice. She goes to sleep that night. And in the middle of the night, she gets a notification that says, you've ranked up your innkeeper class. Uh, you've been assigned the innkeeper class. You've ranked up. You have these skills. And she wakes up and goes, what just happened? The reader goes, what just happened? And she's trying to figure it out. That's a really fun concept to me. Um, and it's not just the concept, though. The characterization work is great. Um, you know, the world building is 
almost in a tier of its own in terms of how grand it gets. Um, this is the longest fantasy series of all time, uh, and it's growing at a rate that puts Brandon Sanderson to shame. Uh, this author puts out, you know, multiple chapters a week, most weeks, um, and the chapters can take a long time to read. They're very long. I mean, this, nobody is as prolific as Pyra Abba is. Uh, it's truly special. If you want to find out more, if you're intrigued about this author that has this made-up name and conti continues to protect their anonymity and you want to find out more, I did an interview with Pyra Abba. Uh, you'll have to figure out, if you don't know, haven't watched it yet, you'll have to watch it to figure out how I pulled this off. Uh, click up here. You can watch that interview. It's highly entertaining, uh, if I may say so myself. Uh, it's just one of those videos. A lot of times I'll make a video and I'll go like, I don't know who's watching this. People watch it and I go, why? That's great. Thank you. I wouldn't have watched it, but that's cool that you did. Uh, the Wandering In one is one of the few videos that where I was like, oh man, if somebody else made this, I would have devoured it. Um, I'm also a big Wandering In fan, so that has something to do with it. But yeah, check it out and check out this book. Check out this series. It's awesome. And it's free. On, uh, on the website. You can buy the books for super cheap, like $3 per book for a huge book on, uh, on Kindle. You can only get them on Kindle right now. Um, but, uh, or ebook. But yeah, you can get them on free on the website. The whole thing. It catches up to now free if you want to just read on the website. So check that out. All right. So let's move on to number 65, and that is Valor. This is the second book in the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwen. This was published in 2014. So it is... And we talked a little bit about this uh, at this point in the video, but it's uh, extremely common for me to score the first book in a series as a five uh, and the second book is a four. Um, oftentimes that doesn't happen, but a lot of times it does. Uh, there's something about initial books in a series that really captivate me by showing me this new world, like The Wandering End just did, and letting me explore it during the first book. But even though I already know this world, Valor delivers in spades. The pace of this book was extremely well done. And by pace, I mean, the author says, like, let me go throw the pedal to the metal at the beginning, and I'm actually going to keep it down there. <laughs> and that's, that's great. I don't love it if every book does this, but every now and then to get a book that's just willing to say, yeah, for the rest of the series, we're just going for it. Look, I'm here for it. I, I, if I read every book like that, I would just get burnt out and I'd knock off a lot of years off my life with the stress of just reading all the time. But every now and then, it is awesome. So yeah, the pacing was awesome. The stakes felt higher than ever. Uh, the twists felt appreciated and earned. I love it when a twist is earned. And what I mean by earned is when it happens and you go like, ah, oh, yeah, I should have put that together. Or, uh, yeah, I was kind of figuring it out. I didn't. You brought me there. Good job. Uh, when, it, when a twist is not earned, it's like the author just goes, oh, yeah, and this happened. And you're like, what? How? How would I have ever figured that out? Why, what was the point of reading this? I want the author to treat the reader as if they're a little dumb. Uh, I like it when an author does that sometimes and goes, I'm going to lay out all the hints. And uh, you're not going to figure it out. And I, I just love that. And it makes the rereading so much better. I mean, this book felt somewhat similar to A Song of Ice and Fire to me in that there are like these many different point of views and the scope of the story feels similar in, in the grandness of it. Not overly grand, but just the right tightness of grandness. You know, it's not the same thing as A Song of Ice and Fire. Nothing is. Nothing's the same as anything else, except unless you're first binding, just completely copying uh, The Name of the Wind. Uh, but everything else has something unique about it. Uh, but it's... You know, it feels like fans of A Song of Ice and Fire will probably enjoy this one as well for some different reasons. But I think in general, I think there's a big crossover here. You know, a core difference for me, though, and I say this as someone who loves A Song of Ice and Fire, is that every single point of view in this book is interesting. Now, I, I, I do think I like A Song of Ice and Fire. I don't know if I like it more. Just as much. Um, but I remember in A Song of Ice and Fire that I would sometimes get to a point of view character and I'd want to hurry up and get through to the next one. And that's just not true in this series. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The battle sequences in this book are just truly masterclass. That is always true for a John Gwen book. All of his battles are amazing. They're like the best you could ever do because he's like the best person in the world at writing battle sequences. So if you like that kind of thing, if you like fast paced, if you like multi POV, check out Faithful and the Fallen.
Um, all right, number 64, and this is a new one to the list, entirely new. It's not moved around at all. It has made it here for the first time, and that is at number 64, Son of the Black Sword. This is the first book in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior by Larry Correa. This was published in 2015. This is one of those books that showed up on my Patreon raffle wheel, and when I got selected, I went, ugh, internally, uh, because I was not excited to read it, because the cover looks ludicrous to me. I hate the cover. I've never heard of it before, never heard of the author before, and that usually spells a bad book. Now, sometimes it spells an amazing book, like this time, but most of the time, that's not a good recipe for somebody like me, uh, and I was just blown away. I mean, this thing rocks. It, it really, really rocks. Like, from the first few pages I was in, and it was, this, it was one of these moments where I'm like, I know I'm not going to love it, but these first few pages are great. And I kept reading, and I was like, that first chapter was baller. I loved it. And then I got to the second chapter, and it moved, like, time periods to a new time period. And I was like, all right. And I read it, and I was like, that was amazing. And I kept reading this book, and I kept having that feeling. And at a certain point in the book, I was like, yep, this is dope. This is really good. It's not going to go downhill. I can't wait to evangelize this book for everybody because most people haven't even heard of this book before, let alone read it. Um, but it's just great. Uh, I can't even explain too much about what it's about because of spoilers, but it's got this crazy innovative world building where you've got these, uh, these characters that like the world has devolved into a totally master class of people that keep the rest of the people in essential slavery and they don't even realize it. it's just part of this crazy caste system. Uh, you've got this separate people that are the, the, I don't know what the name is, uh, but they're a group that protects everybody else from these like eldritch horrors that come out of the water and attack people that are getting more frequent as time goes along. There was a battle a long time ago between good and evil, and the good people won, and they pushed out all these evil creatures into the oceans. So the oceans is somewhere nobody will ever go. Like, you never want to live on the ocean. And now people, like, the poorest of the poor have to, but it's like the opposite of what we think of. Because I look at the coast and I think, like, million dollar households, way more than that. I live in California. <laughs> like, million dollar households can be, like, in the middle of, like, a lame little house in the suburbs. Um, but. It, here it's like it's the opposite, and this group of people has to go and like defend people when these monsters come through. You've got this guy who's got this black sword that is crazy, crazy powerful, and learning about how he got the sword. You do these moments where you go back in time, the drama he gets uh, he gets wrapped up in this self, like this crisis of self that he has to go through. This amazing journey, the darkness of the book, the amazing themes that go along with it. The great writing. It's, per it's, it's one of those books that's almost like perfect. I love it. Larry Correa himself is a little bit more of a controversial figure. I've found out since. Um, I knew about the thing he was involved in, but didn't know he was like the center of it. Um, but there's this drama that, has, that went around at the Hugo Awards, like, I don't know, a decade ago. Um, that totally kind of changed the way that we look at them and involved people voting for their friends and... Now we only get certain books from certain authors that believe certain things, and he was against that, and a bunch of drama. Uh, if you want to look it up, Wikipedia search for, like, Sad Puppies is the name of the thing. It's a weird name. Uh, I know there's a reason for it, but it's a thing. Check it out if you want the backstory on why this guy is controversial, but I don't care. This book's dope, and I like it, and I can't wait to read more. And I, I'm very optimistic that the next book is going to be awesome as well, and I might find one of my favorite series of all time. That would be awesome, and I can't wait to find out if that's true. All right, so number 63 is The Veiled Throne. This is the third book in the Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu, and this was published in 2021. So uh, the Dandelion Dynasty is tied for my second favorite fantasy series of all time, and it's only four books. Um, and the other three are way higher than this one. This is the one book that is a little bit downscored from the other ones. But to have my least favorite book from a four-book series be my 63rd favorite book of all time uh, is bonkers. It, it truly is. I, I mean, this series is just so amazing. Uh, in general, this series can be uh, described, I don't know about easily, I'll do my best. But the first book, you've got this uh, crazy fast, action-paced, historical type book that tells the history of this uh, major conflict that happened in this world that 
totally um, changed the way this whole world is governed. And it shows essentially the rising of power of a, of a new power in this world. Um, and the second, third, and fourth books tell a new narrative story that involve a, an invasion of this world um, or of this continent and the war that happens between these two different nations. Um, and this is the third one in the series. I, I love so much about this book. Just the world building, the characters, the perfect writing that Ken Liu uh, is able to pull off in this book uh, from a writing technical perspective. The one thing that held this book back from it being one of the all-time, like, top of the top of the top was there was a large amount of this book, not, not 100 pages or so, but more than that, that involved these characters that you don't feel like have a central point to the story involved in what I can only describe is a master chef or an iron, uh, what is it? Iron chef like parody. And it's like these two different restaurants decide to battle each other in a formal competition among three different categories um, of like taste and service and ingenuity or something. I don't remember what the third one was. Um, but it's like a lot of pages back to back to back only dealing with that concept while they while they figure out like this, who wins this one competition. It goes and tells this other story. It comes back and then it's like, all right, let's do another 50 plus pages of this next portion of the, of the competition. And even upon finishing this series, it didn't feel like it was super needed. It felt very strange. It's like the one part of the book. It's like, why was that there? Am I too dumb to figure it out? Probably. Um, but I, I still don't understand it. It, a lot of people talk negatively about that part of the book. Some people will obviously, cause everybody can find wonders and something will say like, Oh no, it, you know, perfectly illustrated the, you know, the connection between these themes and these other things going on in this other part of the world. Yeah. It didn't make sense to me. So that's the one thing that held it back, but yeah, absolutely perfect series outside of this you know, a couple hundred to 200 pages here. Um, but yeah, awesome stuff. Love the book. Love the series. I know I didn't really say much positive about the book, but I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the Dandelion Dynasty later on this vi in the series. So stay tuned for that. All right. Uh, almost done with today. And that is number 62. And it is The Bone Ships. This is the first book in the Tide Child trilogy by R.J. Barker. And this was published in 2019. So the Tide Child T Tide Child Trilogy is one of the few trilogies uh, that I've given five stars to each of the books. I found this one to be not as good as the next one and a little bit better than the third one. Um, it didn't need to do that slow build up that a lot of first books do. It kind of brought you right into it. It had probably like 20 pages of here's the character, here's why they're here, and let, let's meet this other main character, and now we're off to the races. Um, it's a story about a ship captain who captains a, this black ship that is only used for people that are either convicts or down in their luck and they work the ship till they die and they have to be on it in service of their, of their kingdom. And this guy is such a horrific ship captain that I don't even think he's been out to sea when this has happened. Him and his whole crew are just on land, drunk as can be, and he's just atrocious as a ship captain. This woman shows up, and she is a badass, and she takes over the ship very easily, whips everybody into shape, drafts the former captain to be her number two, and the entire point of view is from this number two character, which on its own, I love that literary device where the main character is not the point of view. We get things from a backup character. Love that kind of thing. Um, but you get to see the ship transform. You get to see the politics of these two worlds that are coming together, that are trying to fight. Um, they've been at war for a really long time uh, since anybody can remember. And everything is on islands. Uh, it's one side of the island, one half of the islands and the other. And they're fighting over essentially scarcity of resources because in this world, there are no trees. The boats are made of drag of like just extinct dragon bones. They're not dragons, but they're like sea dragons. Um, and they've been gone for a really long time. And since none of them can arm around anymore and ships get lost uh, due to battle every now and then, the quantity of ships that everybody has is steadily declining. Another one of the, and peace is soon on the horizon because they're going to figure out we have to come together. Well, another one of these sea dragons just showed up 
and everyone is in a race to kill it first. Because if you can kill it, they're enormous. It'll make tons and tons and tons of ships and essentially make it so they can win the war. And you have this ship that is not really sure which side they're going to go on or even if they're going to pick a side. Um, the writing in this book is masterclass. It's top of the top of the top of the top. Uh, for me, obviously, writing quality is different for everybody, but I just love it. I think the characters are, are absolutely wonderful. I found the plot to be the weakest part of the book. Um, normally, I need my plot to be perfect. It's not here. It's uh, it's a little all over the place. It's a little weak. Um, but there's so many things to love about the book besides that that it'll show up as one of my all-time favorites. And the plot gets better as the series goes along um, until the ending, uh, the very, very, very ending. Uh, but we'll talk about that one later on. All right, let us now move on to the final book on this list, and it is number 61, The Mad Ship. This is uh, the second book in the second Realm of the Elderlings trilogies, The Live Ship Traders. So Realm of the Elderlings, a 16-book series. It's split up into five different series. This is the second of the mini-series within the main series. It's a trilogy. It has very little, if nothing, to do with the original trilogy. It tells a brand new story in a new part of the world and jumps from first-person perspective now to this trilogy being third-person, multi-POV. I talked about the first book in the series, uh, the ship of magic in my previous video now we're talking about this one um you know wow <laughs> i i just loved everything everything about this book uh and i just i think i was shocked when i first read this how it took me so long to get to this book you know i hadn't heard anything super popular about this series you know i knew about the series i knew the that fits the main character from the first trilogy is like an all-time favorite. I know those storylines that involve Fitz are like the best. This one's like an offshoot, this totally different thing. Um, and so when I came around to reading it, I was just wowed. I mean, I had no idea how much I needed a fantasy pirate series in my life. Um, and I'm like simultaneously saddened um, and glad but I'm sad because it, I'm probably never going to read another fantasy pirate book that can be better than this one. This is like the pinnacle of fantasy pirate books. And it's one of the first ones that I've read. I've read things since then. But this series is just like takes it to a new level. I mean, the first book had a much needed slow burn at the beginning to establish the characters. But this book didn't need any of that. It just got right into the action. I mean, the characters continue to receive more development, as you would expect from a Robin Hobb book. Robin Hobb, in my opinion, is the greatest of the greats when it comes to character development in her, uh, in her series. They're just absolute perfection. I, use, I don't use that word lightly, but it's literally perfect. Um, the, you know, the, the new locations here that we get to discover are much needed. They're extremely interesting. They're unique. They give that world building that's needed. They bring the story along. You know, it's rare to read a fantasy book that shifts POVs where I equally love every single person from here. It's not that I don't dislike any of them. I equally love them all. So when I finish a chapter, I can't wait to read the next one because I don't care who the point of view is. It's just awesome. You know, it's also rare to read a fantasy trilogy and have the middle book deliver in such a positive way as the middle book usually has trouble being interesting enough while also serving up as a setup for the finale. I have had a lot of problems with middle books. Now, oftentimes I end up liking a second book if it's a longer series, a four book series or more. I can love them, but a trilogy... Almost always, the second book is the weakest in the trilogy. It's really hard to write a good good second book in a trilogy because you can no longer do the setup. You don't get to finish it. It just is like a weird middle part. But it was awesome and better than the first book. And it just had so many plot points that hit so perfectly that just made it awesome. It knocked it out of the park. Wonderful stuff and set things up for one of the best books of all time in Ship of Destiny that we will talk about not next week or not the week after, much later on in this video series. So that is it for this. Thank you so much for watching the series. Go back and watch the other ones if you haven't done yet and check out the next of this series, which should come out in a week or so. So thank you so much for sticking to this really long video. And as always, a very happy reading to you. Thanks again to all of my patrons. The special shout out to my Ascendant tier and Librarian tier patrons. Anna G, CJ, Doust, Darren, Gil, Gregory, JD, Jonathan, Nathan T, Nev's Book Channel, Orthodoxia, Ron Reich, Russell, Ryan L, Sydney Baker, Tay C, Tahir, Tommy, Zion, 
Anna, Andra, Blair, Brock, Evan, Joe UK, Cat Mick, Michael Sugarman, Philippe, Sky, and Wacky. Thanks for sticking to the end of this video, and if you want to watch some more content from my channel, click over here and I've got some good videos for you. Thanks so much.